In plastic surgery, when it comes to injectables, no material has been as controversial as liquid silicone. But yet, despite its known complications, it's still in use today. Let's talk about the history and the use of liquid silicone. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Aesthetic Minutes. The history of cosmetic medicine has been filled with controversy right from the start, beginning with paraffin. However, no substance has evoked as much contention in the United States as liquid silicone, and its history is closely tied to the evolution of the FDA and its regulatory actions. Silicone was first discovered and synthesized by Frederick Kipping, a British chemist at the University of Nottingham in England in the 1890s. Molecularly, silicone is an inorganic polymer made up of dimethyl siloxane subunits, which are composed of silicon, oxygen, and two carbon groups. The long chains formed during the polymerization process created a material that was chemically inert, hydrophobic, and possessed a high thermal stability, all of which were very useful properties for a variety of industrial applications. On top of that, silicone could be made into a thin or viscous liquid or even turned into a rubbery solid simply by adjusting the size of the molecules or cross-linking them, which made this material incredibly versatile. Certain silicone compounds are used to protect aircraft radio. In the 1940s, silicone gained widespread adoption as a high-quality lubricant and insulator in the automotive and aerospace industries. However, as the United States entered World War II, the sudden high demand for silicone products were used by the U.S. military in aircraft engines and transformers led to a shortage of supply of this important material. This is Dow Corning in Midland, Michigan, the world's first and largest silicone plant. In response to this, the U.S. government commissioned the Dow Corning Corporation to explore applications of silicone and mass-produce a variety of silicone products, including the liquid form known as DC-200 silicone oil. DC-200 was an industrial-grade form of liquid silicone, contaminated with heavy metals and other impurities, intended for use as an electrical insulator for transformers and not meant for use for medical purposes or injection. The silicones have brought improvements in the field of medicine, too. As applications in medicine were explored, the solid form of silicone, a silicone rubber known as silastic, was also found to be quite useful in medicine due to its biocompatibility in human tissues and began to be employed in the manufacturing of indwelling medical catheters and prosthesis. However, the liquid form of silicone itself was not included in any medical applications at the time and was largely disregarded. Throughout the world, throngs of people hailed the end of the war in Europe. Following the war, during the U.S. occupation of Japan, the U.S. military began to notice the sudden disappearance of drums of DC-200 silicone oil from the docks of the Yokohama Harbor in Japan. Subsequent investigation revealed that the DC-200 fluid was being routinely employed as a cosmetic injectable in the augmentation of breasts, particularly sought after by Japanese prostitutes who were seeking to attract U.S. servicemen through a more westernized look. Soon enough, the practice spread to the United States in the 1960s, where it quickly became a popular treatment despite lacking any safety information or clinical guidelines and being largely performed by untrained, unlicensed practitioners. The DC-200 fluid had a tendency to migrate away from its original site of injection, which caused the results to degrade quickly. As an attempt to minimize this, Dr. Sakurai, a Japanese physician, devised an adulterated version of DC-200 silicone oil, dubbed the Sakurai formula, which incorporated vegetable oils to the mixture to induce a scarring reaction that helped prevent its spread. In 1962, the Dow Corning Corporation, in response to recent applications of silicone oil for use in burn victims, created a pure form of liquid silicone called DC-360 medical fluid, which was meant only to be used topically on burned skin. Despite the fact that this liquid silicone product was never intended for injection into tissues, the 360 variety gained some acceptance among a few plastic surgeons as an injectable due to its pure form and supposedly better safety profile. The use of silicone injections in plastic surgery thus boomed in the 1960s, even as reports of severe reactions to liquid silicone were starting to pile up. Early on, most of the tissue reactions were blamed on the DC-200 fluid, which was of industrial grade or adulterated via the Sakurai method, rather than the DC-360 fluid, despite there being no clinical studies on either type of liquid silicone. In 1962, Congress passed a landmark Kefauver-Harris Amendment enforced by the FDA requiring that manufacturers provide proof of effectiveness and safety of any drug prior to market approval. 
Then, in 1965, the FDA labeled DC-360 medical fluid silicone a drug, forcing the manufacturer to not provide evidence of safety and effectiveness through clinical trials. In response to this, in 1965, the Dow Corning Corporation applied for and began clinical trials with its new injectable form of medical-grade silicone of an even higher purity and sterility, dubbed MDX4-4011. However, the clinical trials were marred by poor patient follow-up and lacked sufficient data to allow any conclusions to be drawn on the safety of MDX4011, resulting in the termination of its investigational use exemption by the FDA in 1976. In 1979, the FDA redefined liquid injectable silicone as a Class III medical device, and a repeated attempt at a clinical study of MDX4011 in the 1980s was pursued by Dow Corning. However, multiple clinical trial deficiencies were again identified by the FDA, resulting in non-approval in 1990. Today, we're here to examine the recent decision of the Food and Drug Administration regarding the availability of silicone gel breast implants. By then, the widely publicized congressional hearings on the safety of silicone breast implants had begun, which would eventually end in the FDA issuing a decade-long ban on the cosmetic use of silicone breast implants and forcing the Dow Corning to abandon its pursuit of approval for MDX4011 altogether. As a result, liquid silicone has never received FDA approval as an injectable material for any cosmetic purposes. However, several developments in the mid-90s cleared a path for its routine use in humans. In 1994, liquid silicone received FDA approval for the treatment of retinal detachment in HIV patients, which was a relatively rare problem in the general population. However, with the passage of the FDA Modernization Act in 1997, physicians were given the ability to utilize any approved drug or device for off-label use. This meant that suddenly, medical-grade liquid silicone could be injected for completely unrelated purposes, including cosmetic treatments, in a way that, although not FDA-approved, was also not prohibited. Thus, the two existing forms of medical-grade silicone, Silicon 1000 and Adatacil 5000, have been employed as cosmetic fillers by some practitioners, despite the lack of sufficient long-term safety studies for this specific use. The medical literature is filled with case reports of these chronic inflammatory reactions to silicone, called siliconomas, which can cause permanent disfigurement, and we still don't quite understand why some patients develop these tissue reactions. Unfortunately, in many cases, it is impossible to determine which form of liquid silicone was injected, and though it appears that in most instances, a substandard technique, poor patient preparation, and the use of non-medical grade silicone were employed, it is by now well established that even high quality medical grade liquid silicone can lead to severe permanent complications. Thus, most plastic surgeons today agree that liquid silicone treatment should be reserved for only special cases and performed only after a careful review of the risks and benefits and obtaining informed consent from each patient. Fortunately, as the silicone controversy was raging on, medical researchers were already studying a new, better cosmetic injectable material, collagen. To find out more about the rise and fall of collagen injections, tune into our next episode of Aesthetic Minutes. Thank you for watching.